Hi everyone. In this lecture, we are going to continue our discussion of moving, handling, and positioning the surgical patient, which is chapter 18 in our surgical technology book. And in this part two of a part three series, we are going to be talking about the principles of safe positioning as well as potential patient injuries. And then we will dive into a discussion about the general overview of the operating room table. And then we'll talk about three positions, which will all be a slight variation of supine. So we'll talk about supine, then we'll talk about Trendelenburg and reverse Trendelenburg. So let's get started. All right, so as I promised, uh, first things first, we need to talk a little bit about some principles for safe positioning, okay? So safe positioning is really is a coordinated effort. So we've talked about teamwork time and time and time again. Um, some things that we want to think about overall is protecting the patient's airway at all times. And these aren't listed on the slide. We're gonna uh, dig into to these little boxes that are listed on the slide, but just to keep some thoughts in the back of your mind. First, to protect the patient airway is one goal of positioning. Another one is to allow access to monitoring sites on the body. Thirdly is to provide venous access for the administration of medica medications. Fourth is to provide adequate exposure to the operative site. And lastly, maintain and promote homeostasis. So, Continuing with those principles, we're going to start on the top left and kind of snake our way down through all of these. So first, let's talk about the equipment. We want to make sure that the equipment is assembled correctly. This means making sure that we have all of the parts and pieces. Sometimes when we are using these positioning devices, there's at least two, if not more, components that you need to be able to attach it to the bed or assemble it correctly. So we want to make sure that we have all of those parts and pieces, and we want to make sure that they all fit together and we have the proper ones. Some stirrups, uh, for example, come with a different attachment that goes to the bed than other brands do from other manufacturers. So we want to make sure we have the right stuff before we even start. We want to make sure that we tighten the locking devices of all the weight bearing accessories so that it doesn't accidentally fall or give when we place the patient into it or onto it so that they don't get an injury. All right, moving across uh, the top, teamwork. Again, it's the responsibility of every single member of the surgical team to ensure that positioning is carried out and executed safely. We also want to make sure that we maintain the correct alignment of the patient's cervical spine. This ensures that we do not injure the, the neck and that we maintain the airway. All right, we're starting on our second line here as we're talking about the anesthesia care provider. So the anesthesia care provider, like I mentioned in the previous lecture, is going to be the one that calls all the shots when we are moving and positioning the patient. So they're going to indicate if it's safe to do so. And you don't want to move the patient in any way until anesthesia says that it's okay. All right. We also want to make sure that we have enough people when the time comes to position the patient safely. And we want to make sure that they know what we're doing, what their role is, okay? 
If repositioning is necessary, again, anesthesia is the one that's going to guide that. Okay. Once they are into position, we want to make sure that we pad all bony prominences. All right. So this is going to protect the, the soft tissue that lies on top of those bony prominences. It's also going to protect shallow nerves and blood vessels. We also want to be aware of all the tubings. All right. The patient could have a variety of wires, tubes, drains, catheters attached to them. We just want to make sure that in, these don't get disconnected, torn out, those kinds of things. Then we want to think about range of motion. Okay, range of motion. We want to make sure that we move the patient's body within their normal range of motion. It could be different from our range of motion, depending on what's going on with the patient. And we want to make sure that before we move any part of the bed that uh, the fingers are out of the way. All right, we'll talk about the table breaks and we just want to make sure that the fingers don't get any type of crushing injury. So we're going to make sure that we know where the hands and fingers are before we start punching buttons to move the table around. And that goes for when we're putting them into position and when we're taking them out of position, there are certain movements that we have to put the table through to get the patient into a position or out of a position sometimes. All right, and then uh, we want to make sure that any straps that we put on the patient are not causing some sort of compression injury. All right, we're going to put that strap across the lap like I talked about before, all right? And that should be applied two inches above the knees. And we want it snug, but we want to be able to fit a couple fingers underneath there, okay? The heel should not rest directly on the table. We have special little foam pads that we can put under the heels or gel pads to make sure that uh, they don't uh, sustain compression injury as well. And then lastly, if the patient is in supine or some form of supine, it's really nice if we can put a pillow under their knees. That's going to help take some of the pressure off from their lower spine. Something else that the book goes over is the different um, range of motion movements like flexion, extension, abduction. Uh, so let's look at that on the next slide. All right, so here we are. If you remember from anatomy class, we talked about these at the very beginning, okay? and. Uh, I like what the book says. I took this quote from the book from page 357. It says, during patient movement and handling, it is critical not to exceed the limits of the joint. We want to be really careful because when a patient is sedated or unconscious altogether, they cannot tell us, hey, that, that's uncomfortable. Okay, you've extended my hip too much or you've extended my shoulder too much or you've um, flexed this too much or rotated that too much whatever the case may be all right so we want to make sure that we are not moving them outside of their normal range of motion Let's talk a little bit about potential patient injuries. There is quite a laundry list of them. On page 357, this is what the book says. Patient safety remains the primary principle on which all positions are based. Patient safety is the goal, okay? So again, I put a little note up here to remind us that normal reflexes are absent in an unconscious or sedated patient. They don't have that pain reflex that we would normally have when somebody moves us in a way 
that doesn't feel good. Think about if you're in physical therapy or you're having a massage and they're doing some joint manipulation. You can guard yourself or you can say, oh, you know, that's a little bit uncomfortable. You know, that's a little bit too far. But our surgical patient isn't going to be able to do that. Some injuries that we might see, and this is not all inclusive, but these are some of the more common ones. The first one at the top of our list is decubitus ulcer or pressure ulcer. And a decubitus ulcer is a result of continuous pressure over a specific area of the body. This compression can, uh, can block blood flow. It can also damage the nerves, right? If we're blocking blood flow, then the capillaries to the skin and the deeper tissues are not able to perfuse those tissues properly because they're compressed. And this could start the process of ischemia or tissue death, uh, and then that could lead to an infection down the road. Something else we worry about is shearing. Shearing injuries occur when a tissue plane, such as the skin, which is the most common, is pulled in one direction while opposing planes are pulled in the other direction. So an example would be if a patient is pulled over a surface like a bed sheet or a blanket. If we're just moving the patient and we're holding the blanket underneath them, still so it can't move and the skin is sliding against that blanket or that sheet that can cause a shearing injury and when we have individuals that have really friable skin this can cause a tear in the tissue musculoskeletal injuries such as compression injuries of the tendons ligaments and muscles can also occur again we want to make sure that we pad the bony prominence as well. We pad the heels. We want to avoid exceeding the patient's range of motion. This can also lead to nerve injury. Situations such as hyperextension or hyperflexion can also result in stretching injuries and or nerve injuries. Again, we talked about compression of blood vessels. This can lead to ischemia. The eyes and the ears are also at risk of being injured. When we put a patient under general anesthesia, they do not close their eyes, right? So we want to make sure that the eyes stay closed and that the eyes are protected. So the anesthesia care provider is going to tape the patient's eyelids in the closed position during general anesthetic. There are also, when we put the patient in some position such as prone, there are special little goggles that they put over the patient's eyes to protect pressure injuries on the eye when they're laying on their face. Ear injuries can also occur if we have the patient on their side and that ear that is down, right, is being pressed upon. Have you ever been like sleeping on your pillow and you wake up and you're like, man, my ear is hurting. You know, you're sleeping on your side. And so you can roll over onto your other side and you can get off that ear, but our patients can't do that. So we wanna make sure that we protect it from folding and we protect it from compression. And there are special pillows that we can use that have like an opening in the middle of them so that the ear isn't being compressed or they're not laying on that ear, okay? Physiological alterations can also occur, all right? And this happens with any rapid change of position or also during some specific positions. Think about if we're putting the patient in the prone position, there is a lot of compression on their chest cavity. So this can make it difficult for 
the patient to breathe, right? Um, it could also contribute to perfusion problems as well. When we have a patient that is, uh, has some sort of circulatory compromise, this can also exacerbate uh, those physiological alterations intraoperatively or during positioning. And then lastly, embolism. Patients are with, uh, obese patients are at higher risk of embolism, but also those that um, have some sort of cardiovascular disease or those that have a prior history of DVTs, embolism, thrombus, those kinds of things. And so that's where we're going to make sure that we put some anti-embolism -embol stockings on the patient or use those sequential compression devices on the patient. Now, if you look at the box on page 359, it does indicate that there are conditions that can predispose patients to injury during positioning. And those are individuals with pre-existing nerve or cardiovascular situations, those that have arthritis or decubitus ulcers, a history of decubitus ulcers. It could also be those with uh, alcohol abuse or those that are smokers. Also, our vitamin deficient and malnutritioned patients as well. Those that have a history of renal disease or hypothyroidism or they've had a fracture before, those things can all contribute if the patient is on certain medications like corticosteroids, that can also increase their risk of injury. And then lastly, patients with contractures or poor skin turgor or reduced range of motion are all at a higher risk of injury during positioning. All right, so I thought it would be interesting uh, as we moved into our discussion about the operating room table to see what it looked like when it was first invented. And uh, so here is an interesting comparison. You see the one on the right is around 1770 when this OR table was invented. It was all made of a uh, wood. And um, I thought that was very interesting and very uncomfortable. Uh, the OR table's not comfortable anyways, but this one would have been, man, I, I can't even imagine what the patient felt like when they woke up. If they woke up, uh, surgery wasn't very successful in the 1770s. So um, anyways, the, the one that we use today is over on the left-hand side. And so that's the one that we're going to be focusing on. Now, the operating room table that you see here can be used for most of the surgical procedures that we do. It can be configured into many positions and it can accommodate a variety of accessories to get the patient into different types of positions for different types of surgeries. The frame is typically stainless steel and it attaches to a hydraulic lift. So you can see the base all the way at the bottom, that metal thing, we call it the base, and then that little tower that you see uh, going upwards is the hydraulic lift, okay? Now, weight restrictions do vary, so it's important that we know and understand how much weight our table can carry. Some batch bariatric tables can hold up to 1,200 pounds. However, there are um, precautionary measures we need to take if we're turning the table around for any reason and putting the patient at the foot with their head at the foot instead of their head at the head. That usually reduces the capacity by half because you don't have that base underneath. Now, some tables, the, the top spins around, and so that um, 
that alleviates that concern for us. All right, so uh, this table is going to have um, articulated or jointed sections at the foot, the head, and the middle. Okay, this is gonna allow the head to go up and down, the foot to go up and down, and we usually refer to these as breaks in the table. Now, I don't know if you can see it or not. Let me see if I can give it a circle it for you. Right here, this is what the book refers to as the hand set, the hand set, okay? And the hand set is the remote for the table. Now, this is gonna allow us to raise and lower the table, lock and unlock the table, tilt the table, put it in Trendelenburg, reverse Trendelenburg, whatever the case may be. And we'll learn to work that in the lab as well. As you can see that there's this base in uh, at the head of the bed, and sometimes, uh, and this one is, is one of those, that the, the base is slightly shifted, more footward, if you will, to accommodate x-ray or C-arm fluoroscopy equipment. Again, there's a wide variety of attachments and you can see some of them already attached to this bed. That's why I like this image. Um, a couple things I just wanna talk about before we go into looking at some additional positioning aids is the arm boards. So the arm board, there's usually two of them that come with the table and they're right here and we'll learn how to put them on and take them off. But this is where the patient is gonna rest their arms. We wanna make sure that we position the arms less than 90 degrees to prevent a brachial plexus injury. Stirrups, let me circle those for you. Uh, actually, yeah, these aren't really stirrups, but one kind of a stirrup. There are several different kinds, and we'll look at some others as we go through the different positions. But the stirrups are gonna be used to elevate and abduct the legs when we are positioning in lithotomy position to give us access to the perineal area. And again, these are one type. They're also Allen stirrups. There are ones called fins, a yellow fins. There are also candy cane stirrups. So we'll look at those when we talk more about lithotomy. There are also various types of headrests and we'll look at some of those as we move forward. All right, so here we are looking at some positioning aids. And we're, I numbered them for you so you can kind of play along as I'm talking about these. Now, the book uh, starts the discussion on positioning aids with different gel and foam pads. So number one, you're looking at the foam pads, and these can be used to elevate and stabilize the patient, tilt them from side to side, or isolate different areas of the body that require isolation. Okay, number two, you are looking at some different gel pads and these ones are just for the head and the face, but there are a variety of different gel pads, just as there are a variety of different foam pads. Uh, these are going to help stabilize, again, whatever um, body part, that we need to stabilize, such as the patient's head. Um, it's gonna help alleviate pressure on the occipital bone. If we put one of those nice little gel pads underneath the head, we'll also help with prone positioning. And so that brings us to number three. This is a very nice foam pad 
that can be used for lateral, you see the opening in the middle, that's going to um, relieve compression of the ear and or um, can use it for prone positioning as well. And this, let me get my pin out again, this uh, little slot right here, green's probably not the best color, it doesn't show up very well. This slot right here on either side is going to be used for the anesthesia tube, okay? So when we are positioning in prone, and we'll talk about this, we position, we put them to sleep on the gurney, and then uh, the anesthesia care provider is going to intubate the patient, and then we're going to roll them over, log roll them onto their bellies, and their face is gonna go in this area right here, and then the tube will lay nicely right there, okay? So that is that um, positioning pillow. Uh, so let's look at number four. Number four is the, um, the prone positioner, or it's an example of a prone positioner. There are different ones, but this is going to be uh, used to elevate the thorax and hip region and give us access to the spine. Okay, moving on to number five. This, this um, person looks like a little burrito right here. This is called a vac pack, or sometimes we refer to it as a bean bag positioner. So it's a sealed pouch and they come in a variety of sizes. Sometimes they're only half the length of this one that you see here. And they are filled with these little beads, All right? So we'll have this on the bed before the patient moves over. And a lot of times we use this for lateral positioning and uh, we'll go ahead and give the patient their anesthesia, get them intubated. Then we're gonna get them up onto their side and we're gonna mold this um, bean bag up around them and then we're gonna hook a suction to it and pull out all the air. And that's gonna make it really rigid, all right? Um, one thing we have to think about if we're using one that is smaller than this is to make sure that we pad any areas where the the patient might be resting on that edge of the bean bag because it becomes really hard. So put a pillow or a gel pad under that thigh uh, so that there is um, less risk of a compression injury or pressure injury. Now moving on to number six, this is what we call the head tongs head tongs. Um, <clears throat> there are some different types like the Gardner and the Mayfield. And these are for when we do cranial surgery. And this particular one has sterile surgical pins that will be placed into the patient's skull and it will hold the patient's head in place. Uh, lastly, the sequential compression devices. That's what we're looking at in number seven. There are different types. There are plexipulse ones that just go on the foot. There are ones that are just for the, um, between the knee and the ankle, which are the calf ones. And then there are also ones for thigh and calf. Um, I don't, I guess maybe it depends on the facility. There's different schools of thought regarding which ones work better. They are a single use item and typically the nurse will and the anesthesia care provider will determine which ones are going to be used and the nurse a lot of times will put them on in pre-op because we want them to you know be hooked up and started essentially uh, well, best case scenario before the patient goes under anesthesia. That doesn't always happen. Um, so they will, uh, the nurse will go ahead and put these on. They're a non-sterile item. They'll hook them to the machine. And again, the nurse and anesthesia care provider are going to determine which ones and what the setting should be on the device itself.
All right, so now we're moving into talking about our three surgical positions for this lecture, which will be supine, also referred to as dorsal recumbent, Trendelenburg, which is a modified supine position, and reverse Trendelenburg, which is also a modified supine position. So first, let's talk about the supine position. Procedures that we usually use the supine position for are those of the head and neck, the ear, eye, breast, abdomen, vascular procedures, and some orthopedic procedures such as ankle fractures, maybe some tendon stabilizations, fractures or procedures of the hands and feet, and also the radius and ulna. We do need a minimum of two people for this, but four is better. All right, we're going to play some sort of uh, foam or gel pad underneath the patient's head. Um, we also want to think about the eyes, the ears, and the facial nerves. Um, they need to be protected if the head is turned. So let's say we're doing uh, something of the ear and we want the affected ear up. So they're going to rotate the head uh, in the opposite direction. And now we have could have compression on that downward ear. So I want to think about that. Um, also, for carotid endarterectomies, we're going to turn the head away from the affected side. So thinking about the ears in that situation, all right? The arms are going to be extended on the arm boards less than 90 degrees out from the body to prevent that brachial plexus injury, and palms are going to be turned slightly inward towards the patient's body, all right? If the arms are tucked to the sides, which we do that sometimes, we want to make sure that the hands are facing inwards toward the body, and then we're going to wrap them with a draw sheet, and there's some other protective devices that we can use as well to make sure that the um, arms don't sustain any injury. Again, we want to be mindful of where those fingers are if we are uh, tucking the arms. That safety strap, again, two inches above the knees pretty snugly we should be able to get two or three fingers between the patient and the strap now we do not want to put these straps over the skin all right we want to make sure that there is something between the patient and the strap which is not indicated here in this image that you're looking at the heels, we want to make sure that the heels are padded and also a pillow is placed under the patient's knees. If we are positioning a pregnant patient in the supine position, we want to put a little, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, a little wedge underneath the patient's right flank. This is going to shift the weight of baby off from the vena cava. Because if mom is laying flat on her back, the baby's weight is going to be pressing down on the vena cava, and it could compress the vena cava. That could lead to hypotension and compromised fetal circulation. <clears throat> the last thing that I want to say about the supine position is that, and you probably notice this too, if you're laying on your back, one of the things that you probably want to do to take pressure off from your lower back is to cross one ankle over the other. And patients are no different. They get over onto the OR table and they're on their back and they want to cross their ankles to alleviate that pressure. So we just want to make sure that the ankles, ankles aren't crossed because that could also cause a um, compression injury. So just always check that if you're helping out with positioning that those ankles aren't crossed. All right, moving on to a discussion about Trendelenburg. Again, like I mentioned, Trendelenburg is a modified supine position. So all of the things that we talked about previously regarding the positioning of the patient in supine, 
we're also going to adhere to all of those things when positioning in Trendelenburg. Some of the uses for Trendelenburg include lower GI procedures, procedures of the pelvic region, and also the prostate. When we put the patient in Trendelenburg, this is going to shift abdominal contents towards the head or cephalad. Again, minimum of two people, better if we have four. When we have a patient in Trendelenburg, we want to make sure when we bring our Mayo stand over the patient that it doesn't come into contact with the patient's body. Now, this is significant because the patient isn't typically going to be in, well, sometimes they will be, but not all the time is the patient going to be in Trendelenburg before we move our Mayo stand in. We might move our Mayo stand in and get positioned all around the patient, and then the surgeon is going to ask for the patient to be put in Trendelenburg. So again, this is the time you want to be really mindful of your Mayo stand as that um, that table is moved so that it's not resting against the patient. In this situation, it seems to make sense to put shoulder braces on the patient so that they don't slide off the table. However, the book says that shoulder braces are contraindicated because they could damage the brachial plexus. Another thing that uh, the anesthesia care provider is going to be looking for is the onset of hypertension during intraoperative positioning from the level of supine, from level supine to the Trendelenburg position. And so this is the last position that we're going to talk about in this lecture, and this is reverse Trendelenburg. And reverse Trendelenburg, again, is also a modified supine position. We want to take into consideration all of the safety precautions that we used when positioning the patient in the supine position. Some common uses for, tri for reverse Trendelenburg would be uh, cholecystectomy and maybe something with the spleen or the thyroid. Again, we're going to need a minimum of two people, but better if we have four to get the patient into this positioning, okay? You can see here that they have added this padded footboard to the ends of the operating room table, and this is going to help prevent the patient from sliding down towards the foot of the table. They may also use additional padding or some padded boots for the patient's feet. The lower legs, we want to make sure that we put a pillow under the knees and uh, maybe under the heels as well, depending on what positioning, uh, what padding that they've already put on the feet. But we just want to make sure that the heels aren't resting on the operating room table because that could cause a position injury. And then lastly, we also want to be mindful of the Mayo stand, all right, because a lot of times we're going to move in and the patient is going to be in the level supine and then they're going to put the patient into reverse Trendelenburg. So just be mindful of that Mayo stand. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part two regarding moving, handling, and positioning. I hope this was helpful and as always, thank you for listening.